I am on my own today. This uh, this joint presentation, and as I I was I thought that works perfectly. I can I can say, well, this is exactly what happens when your child care falls through or your child feels. But actually, Paul said this was the archaeology that kicked in, and I'm, I'm afraid a, a quarry waits for for no archaeologists. So. Um, once again, I'm left holding the bake, so to speak. <laughs> no, this is, it's not going to be a personal rant, I promise. <laughs> Try not to rant too much, anyway. Um, what I did do is I, I collaborated and I, I spoke with a lot of colleagues and friends. And friends are friends, so Facebook becomes very, really quite useful to get feedback, to get, to get um, experiences from other people uh, to feed into this, to this um, talk. So really, I'm just a sort of conduit for it. Having said that, um, both Ian and, and I are archaeologists. Um, we've both worked as archaeologists since the 1990s. Um, and we have two children, age five and seven. So we've gone through pregnancy, maternity, preschool, um, and school time twice um, whilst, whilst working in the profession. Um, and in that time, um, either one of us, both of us, or, or as individuals, we've been made redundant, faced redundancy, Work part time and self employed, um, been an employee, are employees, um, worked different working patterns, worked in England, worked in Wales, and for a <coughs> range of different sectors in archaeology. So I think we are quite well placed to sort of host this, this, this talk. Um, as Ian's not here, actually, I can probably <laughs> lay off the parent bit in this quite a bit and talk about me and mums, actually. So, <laughs> no, so it's, not a, it's not a personal. Uh, around. So yeah, I canvassed quite a lot of friends and colleagues to get the um, to get the the input for this. Um, it was just... Though quite a few horror stories came back. I'm afraid most of my talk is actually just bullet points, but I didn't manage to get one cartoon there. Though quite a lot of horror stories came back from people. Um, sort of enforced redundancy. I'll put in redundancy in, in the comments there when someone told their employee they were pregnant. Their employer. Um, a refusal by an employer to consider part-time working when um, when someone came back to work, well, when a woman came back to work after maternity um, leave. Uh, one particular case, which I'm sure is not unique, where both parents um, had to be on site 7.30 a.m. every morning for a 12-week contract uh, with absolutely no consideration was prepared to be given for the fact that they had young children and this proved completely untenable for the, for the couple. And the result was, in fact, that, that um, one, of, one of the parents left the company and, in fact, left archaeology entirely because it was just not workable, not feasible. So um, a lot of aspects of this discussion are universal to anybody who's a working parent. Um, and indeed, many people who are working who aren't, aren't parents. But it's, it's the combination of a lot of factors which make the situation even more challenging. And, for this discussion, the prime considerations are the issues encountered by archaeologists, um, and that tends to uh, not be uniquely within the commercial sector, but um, particularly after what I've just been hearing, I think. Um, but mostly, a lot of the comments I was receiving back were from people working in the commercial sector. And, and also, we were working within a predominantly rural area, um, as we are in Wales. So I'll just bullet point through, first of all, um, quite quickly, I'll rattle through some, some points, and then have a little bit more discussion later on. <clears throat> so the requirements of a working parent. These are, these are condensed from comments that people have sent to me. So, first of all, <coughs> predictable working hours. Does that actually work this time? Yes, it doesn't work this time. I'll try So predictable working hours. Essential if you need to organise childcare. <laughs> That's one of the things for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a plane up this morning. So. <clears throat> I can get it if you want. I can see the, the wink or the nod of someone that's pressed. Okay. Okay. Just change lines if you know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just do this. No, I'll just put you on this. Okay. okay. <laughs> Conversely, um, flexibility in working hours, particularly essential when it all goes wrong. Um, when your child's ill, uh, your child care provider is ill or can't work, and those difficult times, school holidays, and those dreaded events, of the snow days, when with a few hours notice, school's shut and, you, and you know, you've got to cope. Stability. 
Uh, a lot of people cited this knowledge that there's going to be a pay packet at least next month, if not further along the line. A living wage, the means to make ends meet. And I'll come to that later on. <laughs> Flexible and imaginative working practices. Um, ideas people flagged up, they included part-time work, um, flexible working hours, um, home working, self-employment was one area that several people said it was the only way they could find to actually get any flexibility within their working pattern working as archaeologists. The big one, accessible to affordable, flexible and local childcare. Absolutely critical if you, if you need to work. Understanding employers. <laughs> this is a, you don't have to be a parent but it helps. Um, and it certainly helps if you felt the pain. Uh, and the utopia everyone wants, a reasonable work-life balance. So, what does commercial archaeology offer? And I say commercial archaeology, as I've seen, it's not, a, it's not unique, but it was, um, this is what, what people say. So it's a great big generalisation. Um, and I'll just summarise the key points that people put through. So, unpredictability. Short notice for commencement and termination of work contracts. Short contracts, is there going to be another, <coughs> when is the next pay packet, packet coming from? Um, and all of these culminate in instability uh, for, for, the, for the work for the parent. Long working hours, or requirement to stay away from home, or long commute times. May, all these make it very difficult to accommodate family life. And low pay. I was quite surprised to see Rachel's um, uh, uh, salary for graduates, and that was 2008. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those sort of salary rates for archaeologists. Um, and this was something that was flagged up by a lot of people, relatively speaking, for a job that almost always requires a degree, which a lot of people said a very expensive degree. Um, you know, a debt generating degree. Pay is low. Um, so I'm going to some of those points in a little bit more detail. Um, a lot of these issues interlink, and it, uh, it's hard to discuss them in isolation. I've tried to sort of tease them out a little bit, but they're also secondary and often perhaps less well considered uh, effects upon the worker. So first of all, if we go to the rates of pay, as I said, archaeological wages generally are low, that's a big blanket gener uh, generalisation. But I think parents struggling to make ends meet, they only have to look around them at friends and family to realise that it's true, you know, whether you're looking at other people with, in similar profesh uh, professionally qualified uh, workers, or blue collar workers, however you want to term it, our wages are, are low. And this is, this is also the case with any sort of work allowances or um, benefits such as away from home subsistence uh, or accommodation rates. And I bet some of you are going, what are these things anyway? You know, um, if, you, if you're working on site and you have a quick chat with some of the construction workers, you'll soon see where you stand financially as the archaeologist. Um, they often demand and they receive higher uh, subsistence pay, as well as, on top of their already higher wages. Um, and when you're responsible for a family, trying to cope on this, on this uh, reduced finances is extremely challenging and stressful. Okay, next one. Short contracts and variable, often long working hours. And I know for a lot of people at the moment, uncertainty in work is it's increasingly common and it's difficult for everybody. Uh, but if you're responsible for a family, um, it's, it's even more challenging, it's even more stressful uh, and exhausting. Exhausting was a, a word that came back to me quite a lot. Other words were, and this is horrible, fear, foreboding, stress, guilt. <laughs> it sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, I mean, raising family is exhausting enough in itself. And as one person put it, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job in itself. And when you've got constant worry, um, about where and when work is, is coming from, if you're working on short contracts, it's incredibly draining. Combine that with the long hours and, it, and the physical demands of, of the job, if you're working out on site, um, it's completely exhausting. You, you mentioned exhaustion before, and it's not just a physical exhaustion, it's emotional, it's mental. <laughs> And then you throw in some guilt. Guilt was another one. People that people are constantly having to ask friends and family for help, childcare help. Um, the, the people are having to get the someone to drive 30 miles every morning so she could leave the house at six o'clock just to go and work out on site. 
Okay, as I mentioned before, a lot of people mentioned self-employment as a way, the only way they could get some flexibility setting up their own business, to get some flexibility within their, their working practices. But that brings, brings with it inherent stresses and, and instability in itself. So it's not, it's not the total answer by any means. It's not a wonder a lot of people, or a lot, a lot of people are thinking it's just not worth it. You know? I called this nitty-gritty practicalities. Um, Really, it was things that didn't really fit in anywhere else. Uh, and it, this is not, it's not just for mums, this little, this little section. Um, it's training and education um, for all, for managers um, and for anybody else working within the industry, um, particularly for site work. And it's factors that need to be considered, budgeted for. Um, one woman said she felt like she was a burden because she had a young child. She felt like a burden to her employer. Just little things. Has anyone needed, requested, or achieved facilities for expressing breast milk on site? Have they had a fridge provided? Has this ever been budgeted for? Has anyone had to ask for it? The only reference I could find to that was an Australian website, an Australian government website. Maternity wear, suitable for site work. I struggled with this seven years ago. Um, uh, and again, high vis health and safety regulations, you can actually get high vis maternity wear now. Again, it's Australia. <laughs> you have to get them from Australia. I can't find a UK supplier. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Has anyone asked for a risk assessment when they're pregnant? <laughs> from the site manager when working on site? And has anyone received a complete look of horror when they asked for that? Or are, the, uh, are, are managers, are people experienced? Are they trained to be able to carry out risk assessments? And if we go to the biggie, childcare provision, we could talk all day about this. Um, this is a major problem for anyone wanting to work, full stop, wanting to work within archaeology, um, certainly the commercial sector, and wanting to work within, if you, if you live and work in Wales, it has extra, extra issues. First of all, cost. It's expensive. Childcare is expensive. Um, I read a recent report that 34 countries uh, Full-time care for two to three-year-olds is the highest in the UK and Ireland out of 34 countries. Um, and yes, there's help, there's help available to pay for childcare, but that's only from registered childcare providers, which is exactly how it should be. They're the most stringently regulated and inspected. But because of that, they're also the, the least flexible. So if your hours of work vary from week to week, it, it can be really, really difficult to get childcare that you can afford. The location of childcare. In a rural area, you can be miles from <coughs> the nearest nursery, and that's usually oversubscribed, or the only child mind in the village, which was, which was my case. <laughs> <laughs> free childcare, which lots of people, I say free, again, in inverted commas, a lot of people, a lot of workers today are using, exploiting, perhaps not the right term, <laughs> grandparents. But so many people said to me, well, I moved away from home to find the work as an archaeologist. I'm miles away from my mum and dad. I can't, I can't use that. And another thing to think about, if as an archaeologist you've waited till your career, there's some kind of stability in your career, or you have a decent income, chances are you're pretty old. <laughs> and you decide to have kids, or you're trying to get round to doing it. The knock-on effect of that is your parents are old as well, and perhaps less able to be able to help out. And within childcare provision, one of the big problems was you think it's all over when they go to school. It is only just beginning. The length of the school day is really difficult to accommodate for any workers, really, but particularly if you've got long hours of travel or long site days, it's very hard to accommodate around that. And school holidays, again, are really difficult to, to um, find a way to, to get rid of your kids. <laughs> um, this infrastructure and technology limits. Um, one of the ways flagged up that people can find to work, and this isn't, this isn't specifically site-based work now, is home working, whether that's on a part-time basis or as a full-time basis. And it's really incredibly beneficial way of working for a lot of people. And it, it's particularly suitable if you live in a rural area where you commute to work, maybe quite, otherwise if you were office space, might be quite, um, quite long. But for that, it's absolutely reliant on efficient and effective communication networks. Your, your broadband speed, your broadband availability, full stop. I mean, I, I have colleagues who, 
quite recently, um, the, the broadband system within the village went down completely and was not going to be reconnected for a week. And she's a home worker and she had to set up her office next to the recycling bins in the village because that was the only place she was in. It's that bad. Um, and mobile phone signal, intermittent or non-existent mobile phone signal. If you work in a range of different areas, you have to be contactable as a parent from, by your childcare provider or by the school. Whether that's if your child has an accident or if you're ill, it's no good if you're not available. You have to have that, that set up. Or if you're just a bad mum and forgot the swim kits. And, uh, <laughs> um, and again, another, another um, situation within, in the rural area is the distance and means to travel. If you have to travel 60 miles to work every day on the motorway, it shouldn't take you more than an hour. If you have to travel 60 miles on a rural road network, <laughs> it can take you two and a half hours quite easily, and that's without factoring logging lorries and lock a sheep in the road, etc. <laughs> etc. Et it's beautiful, beautiful journey, don't get me wrong, but it, you have that at each end of your working day. That has to be factored in. For, for budgeting jobs um, and for uh, looking at the hours of work that your employees work in. And unlike urban areas, public transport is quite often simply not. It's just not practical. Um, the rail network is fairly limited um, and bus services can be completely uh, impractical, unavailable, or the timings just don't, don't work. So we do have those, those issues within um, the rural areas. So after all, all that, why, mm. why would anyone want to employ these tired, exhausted, <laughs> stressed out <laughs> parents who, you know, the riddled with coughs and colds from there? <laughs> you were coughing this morning, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, okay. Well, first of all, we are these multitasking, efficient and effective prioritizers. <laughs> That's me anyway. <laughs> Obviously, this isn't universal to all parents, but it, as we, as we mentioned it earlier, um, as you mentioned it earlier, those skills that are honed uh, in the home and with children, they, they do translate into mm -hmm. the workplace. Um, a desire for stability can equal loyalty again. It's not a universal thing for parents, but there's not many parents who want to move around the country constantly, dragging their family around looking for work. And likewise, there's not many employees who want to continually be retraining staff. If you have a good working relationship with the employer and the employee to consideration, accommodation and flexibility, then you're more likely to go that extra... Did it get the five minutes? I didn't see that. <laughs> I'm more, extra, more likely to be able to I hope to go that extra mile, remain loyal and to work that bit harder. But the most important point is, I put it in capitals, experience. You lose parents from the workplace and you're, you're often losing the most experienced workers. And that kind of experience, it's invaluable, and it's only acquired through time and commitment. Um, the skills drain in the industry, and we've been hearing a lot about the fall off in women in archaeology in the 30s, in their 30s. It's going it, to, it leads to issues of uh, insustainability in good practice in archaeology um, and the archaeological expertise, but also morale and team dynamics. Um, you, you lose that, and you know. It, You've lost an essential part of a, a work team. Is there an answer? Or perhaps do you just have to accept, and again I'm, I'm talking more about site, site work and commercial side of archaeology here. Once you have children, it's time to hang up the trowel. It's simply a fact that commercial archaeology, particularly for the site teams, is just the realm of the unencumbered, or those with very understanding spouses. <laughs> Is it perhaps only for the younger members of the workforce working out on site? Or oh, those who are new to their careers? And I'm asking these all questions. I'm not saying it is. And perhaps even those who are less experienced, I've talked before about experience. Can we all, can we apply imagination and flexibility, which we've mentioned throughout this, to all other areas of archaeological employment? Can home working, flexible hours, job sharing, and part time work be more widely utilised? Someone came back to me and they said, site managers don't seem to understand that we can work part-time. 
on archaeological excavation sites. It does work in a commercial environment. It can work. Um, I myself have, have, have worked like this. But what did become clear from everybody was money is critical and rates of pay critical. You might say money can't buy happiness, but it, um, it can help fund decent childcare, particularly for those difficult areas, like these wrap-around periods um, and the holidays when there's nothing else available. And it can help you reduce your working hours so you can get, get that better balance, the work-life balance. Um, or perhaps give you a breathing space for your life within your, your working life as well. Thank you. Thank you.